Danny, how inspiring has this season been from your vantage point? This season has been absolutely incredible, topped off by this Arlington Renegades win. I speak for ownership when I say the XFL is a league of opportunity. It's a league of our players. They are the game. Our coaches, they are the leaders. And this moment exemplifies that. This is also Coach Stoops' fifth championship win. And Coach, our trophy is very special. We have a space between the X, which represents opportunity and dreams. And you and your staff led this incredible team to that moment, to this open football that represents the future of possibility. Coach, congratulations to you, to your entire staff, to the Arlington Renegades. You are our champions. Welcome back for episode 13 of the XFL Insider Podcast. Today you have your host Matthew, Jake, and Drew, the normal crew back. How you feeling today, guys? Feeling good. Glad to be back around you guys, you beautiful people. Yeah, it's a nice energized after having a couple weeks break from doing things. <laughs> I mean, not... I mean, it, it. let's just say this, spoiler alert, it's going to be a short episode this week because there's not a whole lot going on in the postseason. Yeah, a lot to discuss, but in terms of actual depth, uh, we don't have too much. <laughs> now, I mean, and most importantly, let's talk about the championship game. Guys, did you get a chance to watch that? I, I attended his media, had an awesome time. I'll, I'll share my experience, but first I just want to see what you guys thought about the game. I watched it and I was floored. I did not. Ex- I, well, I guess pretty much everybody didn't expect that to happen. The idea that the team that had a losing record would come in and win the championship was something that I considered, but didn't really give a whole lot of merit to. But I think that shows just how good uh, how good Perez really was down the stretch. Luis Perez really picked up that team and put it on his back and and did the heavy lifting down the stretch and made everybody around him better. And, you know, he's done this, what, six other times in spring leagues and the and the NFL and been an absolute journeyman professional. And for him to finally pull it off, I think, uh, was rewarding for his career, it was rewarding for him personally, you could tell. Uh, winning the MVP of the championship game, giving that inspired halftime speech to say, hey, you know, we got to shut these guys out in the second half. We got we can't let them get back into it. They're going to do everything they can to get back into it. I think I think Perez really Perez is the reason they won the championship. Uh, there's not a doubt in my mind, but the game itself, uh, 35 to 26 for the Renegades. The score was not indicative of the of the tail kicking that took place. What did you think about it, Jake? Any opinions? Well, I did not watch it because, unfortunately, MLS was the priority of that day. Um, it's really, let's just say it's uh, really dumbfounding how th- this championship came to its you know, final destination and its final outcome. You know, you had a team that really didn't have that hot of a season, you know, enter the playoffs, essentially the 
underdog in the whole situation. Uh, you know, up you you upset um, Houston. I believe that's who you guys played uh, in the uh, divisional championship. Yep. And then turn around, and you Arlington turns around, you know, and Perez had a role in that. Uh, and then turn around and completely, and and I'm sure there were some issues, probably with player health and injuries in, on the DCN. But for someone to uh, uh, to topple the top team in the overall league in the championship i mean if i watched that my jaw probably would have fallen to the floor because this is a thing that does not usually happen you don't see it in the nfl you don't see it in the cfl at least not in you know at least in the 10 past 10 15 years it hasn't been a regular thing. Uh, really wasn't even a regular thing when uh, arena football was around. So, you know, to see this, I'm sure it was considered as a good for business thing for the XFL. Even though even weeks after the fact, I'm not even sure whether it was good for business or not. It's just hard to tell. And we probably won't know the uh, far reaching impacts until this upcoming season. Yeah, I think there's two two kind of good points that you either touched on or or came close to touching on and and one of them so I'll stick with the, you know, how far reaching impacts, you know, was this good for business or not? I do think overall it was probably good for business because this gave The Rock and Danny Garcia a chance to get up there after they had all the signings the week before the championship for the uh, XFL players in the NFL. They got to get up there and say, hey, this is what we're talking about. The team that everybody expected to lose won the whole thing. And this is what second chances are all about. Now you're going to have people from both of these teams getting signed in the NFL. And, you know, watch watch us do what we say we were going to do in, in terms of giving players second chances. The other point that I wanted to touch on was uh, the injury issue and the biggest injury was michael joseph for uh, yes sir for dc he was not able to play he dressed out but he was held held out as well so he didn't play at all in the game and you could kind of see that it mattered but at the same time luis perez was absolutely on fire from 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 the get-go i mean 10 yards first down 10 yards first down 10 yards first down it seemed like it, it seemed like every play he was just you know, ticking another another mark off the box. And I don't think that Michael Joseph really would have changed that too much. DC does a lot of man coverage. They do a lot of, you know, uh, blitzing, trying to make the quarterback act quick. And Luis Perez showed if you do that to him, you're going to pay the price because they're going to run five and 10 yard outs. They're going to run short stuff. They're going to run man beaters with some mesh across the middle. They're going to run smash concepts. When you decide you want to go, you know, cover two man under uh, or cover two, they're just going to they're going to punish you when you try and send people. You know, they're going to take what's there in front of them. And every once in a while, they're going to take a shot. And Luis Perez took some shots, uh, both throwing the ball down the field and took some, you know, took some pretty heavy hits uh, from from D.C.'s defense. But I don't think if anyone told us that somebody was going to get over 30 points that anyone would have guessed it would have been the Renegades. I think everybody probably would have put their money on DC to score 30 plus and they came close, but the big story was the Renegades offense and the lack of offense for the defenders. Yeah. The, the ending, they had a little bit of offense coming back, some, some deep plays, but nothing to redeem that. Awful gameplay from the other quarters. Now, right. talking about Perez, he went 26 of 36. He had 288 yards and three touchdowns. He had no interceptions this game, and he added six rushes for 10 yards. Like you said, the man was on fire, and this was the Renegades' best game as well as his best game this season. 
it, it was something to watch, especially just coming off the Houston uh, beat out, considering where Houston was our team. So, mm-hmm. well, I mean, with DC, Arlington did did a really good job of making uh, Jordan Tiamu beat them on specific play styles through the air. That was what they they bet on. A lot of Tiamu's 245 yards that he gave up, and Tiamu was barely over 50 percent passing. He had two touchdowns, three interceptions, was 16 for 30 for 245 yards. So a big chunk of those 245 yards were late in the game when Arlington was playing off coverage and giving them stuff underneath and basically yep, trying yep. to make them waste time. But before that, in the first three quarters, Arlington absolutely smothered Tiamu. Basically, by sit, they were playing a, a lot of cover two and a lot of two man under and basically putting the squeeze on Tiamu by making him look for his longer routes. Anything that was short was covered, just blanketed. So they were taking it away, and Arlington did a good job of keeping Tiamu in the pocket. Tiamu only had 25 yards rushing. They let him, they let him get away. His longest was 13 yards. So they let him get away once or twice. But he also got sacked several times. They were just closed in on him. They like they were dialed in. That defensive line uh, with T.J. Barnes, all those guys did a fantastic job of keeping yes, him in the pocket and making sure that Tiamu couldn't uh, couldn't punish them underneath. Yeah, coming from past games, I was definitely surprised how the offensive line played for D.C. We usually play. They had a pretty good game all season. Um, in my opinion, this was the worst I've seen their O line perform. I'm not mm. sure if there was any injuries or anything occurring there. Also, uh, but the Renegades defensive line <laughs> looked nasty all night long, even yep. from the box. Yep, absolutely. Their def- their their linebackers were able to make plays. Their secondary was flying around and keeping guys locked down. There was just no room there for for the defenders to have anything because the D-line played so well. They shut down the run. They kept the pass uh, fairly well contained, or they kept the passer contained. That turned the linebackers loose to make plays in the run game. I mean, and the, the passing game. I mean, that interception, I forget what the guy's name was, but the interception that was tipped around a couple times by that linebacker was his first first interception of the year was absolutely a product of of the renegades forcing dc to do what they wanted them to do and not otherwise so basically they they called a a zone play the linebacker read tayamu's eyes the whole way after discussing it with his defensive coordinator the drive before or between the drives and he can't he just made a break on the ball and took it and i mean it was really it seemed like that was the case the whole night. It seemed like the Renegades would do something. DC would try to defend, and that's exactly what the Renegades wanted them, or DC would try to respond, rather, and that's exactly what the Renegades wanted them to do. Now, I wanted to talk, too, about Jake. I know you said it wasn't too big of a success in the way it looked, but I want to note that the game averaged a little over a million viewers, 1.43. That's the most watched game of the XFL this season. That's pretty and that significant. Was AB, and, and that was ABC, correct? Yes. Yes, it was ABC. Yep. Now, we knew coming in, I mean, just from us talking, that those games being on ABC was what got you your numbers. We can look all day at ESPN, ESPN2, but that that main primetime slot is, is where you need to be, and we see that. And hopefully when they do plan things out for the 2024 season, they – you know, they really look into these things and do more than the three regular season games they had on ABC and then the championship game on ABC. They probably might want to at least sprinkle at least one of those XFL games every week on ABC uh, to, you know, that way they get a really fair and even measure on an average viewing audience than just averaging out three, you know, regular season games and then the playoff game. Uh, I think that they'd have a more fair and balanced figure, uh, you know, essentially like an ABC game of the week 
for the XFL. They just need to randomly select the game. I mean, you're going to have teams that are going to have at least two per season if they do it that re- do it by that route. There might be, a t- with it being a 10-week season, there might be two teams that may end up having that third game on ABC. So it's something that they really need to consider going into the 24th season on how they're going to book things out. Because obviously relying on FX, ESPN, ESPN2, and then even the platforms where they don't even have an accurate figure on the audience because they don't include streaming, uh, you know, specifically ESPN Plus, and then even... I'm not even sure if ESPN Deportes, the Spanish uh, channel, was even factored in those results because there was a large contingent of Spanish-speaking people that were also watching the XFL this season. Mm-hmm. So I, I would be shocked if they weren't included in that figure as well. So <clears throat> I know I don't know if you guys have heard the news, but ESPN is leaning towards being just a streaming platform. They're talking about leaving cable. If that happens, that's going to definitely change some numbers for the XFL games. No doubt. But I agree with what you're saying. ABC needs to be a priority as well as any of the main channels there that we can get. That and the flexing of games and dates and times really killed some of those numbers, I feel like. There's many, many games this season that people had plans for that they they wanted to watch and that it was changed last minute. So I feel like that's another thing they could improve upon. Definitely just keeping their original times. Yeah, I think they, the hard part about this is the timing of the season and they did the timing of the season for a reason, right? The exact reason that they, that they have proven this was a proof of concept issue. They wanted to stop the season right after the draft and give these guys that are in this league a chance to get on the mini camp rosters. They've got the success. We're going to talk here in a minute about numbers and, and the people that have signed and things like that. But the the point is it was a proof of concept, not because they didn't know if they could do that. They knew that they could get guys on them on a mini camp rosters. That wasn't a question. They had the talent to do so. The question was, can they be competitive throughout the, a season that is pockmarked with ABC specials and, uh, things like American Idol or, or you know, whatever, or The Voice, whatever's on ABC. Uh, I, yeah, you can tell I watch TV, don't you? Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> That's most of America now. I mean, not many of us watch cable anymore. It's too expensive. We've gotten rid right, of it. But, but those that do are watching the specials, right? They're not watching the XFL at the same time as March Madness. They're not watching the XFL yep, yep. at the same time as The Voice or whatever. You're correct. On. So, you know, there that was the proof of concept. And I think they proved fairly well that they can maintain very competitive numbers. I mean, they were in the top 50 for viewing and, and for a lot of games in the top 20 for viewing for most of the season, you know, that in, in those terms of the proof of concept, I think that the XFL had a very successful season and they're going to have to, I think the flexing and all of those things are just going to be necessary evils as you go into the future. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, while we're just roving on the numbers, let's let's talk a little bit about the actual attendance numbers of the game. I have 22,754 in total attendance there. It was loud and it was rowdy. But as, as I've said, and as many people in the league have spoke, um, Jake, what do you think? You think if we'd have went to St. Louis, that number would have been a lot more? Well, let's just let's just talk about that for 2024. I mean, we can't have the whataboutisms now, considering the ownership already had it in their mind that San Antonio was going to be the home of the revamped championship, the first one time they've ever had one since 2001. And I mentioned this weeks ago, the first XFL championship which was under Vince McMahon, was back in 2001, and it was in the uh, L.A. Olympic Stadium in Los Angeles. This time around, under the whole coalition of Johnson, Garcia, and Cardinal, you know, first one made sense, considering you had three teams in the Lone Star State. You had to choose one of those three teams, considering... Corporate headquarters is in Texas. 
So, you know, I mean, it was merely a business decision that they had already made before they even went public with it. But it makes sense that they do a rotation among all eight cities. Uh, you know, and I, I think 24 St. Louis would make sense considering the dome is literally, I think, I'm not sure if they are the largest stadium in the league or at least top two. But considering the numbers that were pulled this season, there, there's without a doubt you're going to fill that entire building for a championship game. It doesn't matter if they sell up all the seats and then they broker a deal with to even book standing room only in the convention spaces because the convention space is just walking distance. So take advantage of that. If the the Blues aren't using their facilities, work up a deal with them to book Enterprise Center. Do the same thing if the Cardinals aren't playing at Bush Stadium. Same thing, book that space there. Go all out, balls to the wall. If you fill out the dome, fill out the other venues in St. Louis and let them watch along as well. It would be good for the XFL. It would be good for the city of St. Louis. It would be great for the sport of football altogether. While the NFL will continue to kick themselves. Make the owners think, why did we vote for Stanley Enos Kroenke to take the Rams out of St. Louis? when they are clearly a football city. Yeah, I don't think there's ever been any doubt that St. Louis is a football city, really. I mean, and I'm not going to touch on the, the NFL move or anything anything like that. But, you know, St. Louis, I think, was the obvious choice coming in for somebody to host the, the XFL championship. But I think between the fact that there was three, three pro team or three XFL teams in the state of Texas – and the fact that San Antonio has such a rich sports history with the Spurs and with the WNBA and and former arena football, you know, the Spurs, San Antonio is kind of a, not the Spurs, but San Antonio just in and of itself is a little bit of a sports starved city. They basically only got the Spurs. And the Brahmas had pretty decent attendance. I mean, you, you, they weren't, they weren't the same as St. Louis. I think the I think obviously all the losing that San Antonio did this year, even though every game was close, really kind of turned off the fan base a little bit. But I would imagine for the first game next year, they're probably going to have a big a big showing again. Right. You've got guys like Heinz Ward as the head coach that showed, especially towards the end of the season, that they improved, that they got better, that they can be a good team. So San Antonio really lent lent itself to being an opportunity and falling in line with the message that the XFL gave off, which is it's a league of opportunity. And San Antonio had the opportunity to make the game big and they put 20,000 plus in the stadium. Something that I think if you told the XFL owners, Hey, we're going to put the championship game in San Antonio and you're going to get 22,000 people showing up to it, take it or leave it, they would have been like, I'm taking that right now. Give it to me. I don't think they thought that they were going to get 20,000 even. So, uh, you know, it, overall, everything worked out. It seemed like a good showing. It was, I thought it was good for TV, especially with the announcers. The way that they played it was perfect. So, you know, fair play to, to Arlington, champions of the league. Fair play to Luis Perez. MVP of the championship game, I would label it an overwhelming success uh, for the XFL as, as a whole season is concerned. I think I will add one more thing, you know, while we're discussing uh, San Antonio. So in the, M- in the M- MLS, they just announced a new franchise open up in San Diego. But guess which city has been pushing for the next expansion team in Major League Soccer? San Antonio. Currently, they do have a team in the Tier 2 League um, known as the uh, USL, United Soccer League, I think. 
they've been one of the people that's been pushing for to become that expansion team, you know, get out of the tier two and get into the major leagues. So based on the fact, and I do agree, San Antonio is a sports city. If they're able to get another major league team, doesn't matter if it's soccer. I mean, it's better than nothing. They've got the XFL now to tack on top of the Spurs. The Spurs conversation just go, go, just wait for another day because yeah, that's that's a rant for another podcast. <laughs> um, they're trying, uh, and I did see where the mayor said, you know, we see San Diego we got it. We're going to keep pushing, keep trying. And they've been trying f- to get in uh, Major League Soccer since 2017. So I think once they see all these other sports that have been coming in that, that have helped contribute to the local economy in San Antonio, there is just no reason the uh, commissioner is just going to look at it and say, no, no we're not going to give it to him. I, but they'll, rather he'll say, hey, they're starting to prove something here. Maybe we should give them the next franchise. You know, it would definitely be uh, interesting considering, you know, St. Louis's current rivalries, I-70 Derby with Kansas, uh, Sporting Kansas City, the I-55 Derby with uh, Chicago Fire. Why don't we go ahead and make a Western Conference rivalry with San Antonio if we get in? It's it's good for business all around, so why not try? So I think, you know, if things just keep going up well in San Antonio, I don't see how they couldn't get more sports than what they currently have. I right. just thought I'd tack that on. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, it's a good point. And if you look at, I mean, if the XFL is going to put 20,000 people in a stadium like they did with the first XFL game, then... I mean, if you if you just look at demographics, San Antonio has a high Hispanic population. Obviously, the Latino countries have a bigger affinity for soccer than America does. At, at least, well, I guess it it has grown a lot in America. But excuse me, if the XFL is putting twenty thousand people in a stadium on game one, then you can bet that soccer is going to do well, and you can bet really that the health of the sport for XFL moving forward in San Antonio is actually really good. Yeah, that's what I was going to compare that to. I was just going to say, hey, if, if one's successful, that means the other one can be also. There's plenty of fandom there for everyone involved. Yes. I'll note the, the game you speak of in San Antonio, it was against the Battle Hawks, and that was uh, a 24,000 person attendance for that game. So yep. the championship game was actually lower than that game, but this isn't the home team playing. That's the right. Fine. We understand that. I want to note the highest attended game for St. Louis coincidentally was the Arlington Renegades. And that game had 38,000. Just want to note those two numbers and it makes sense what you guys are saying. And I follow but anywho, anything else to discuss on the championship game before we move forward? No, I think we've beat that horse uh, to death pretty much. Now, last thing I wanted to note about the championship game was that the players of that game actually got around $12,000 from the postseason play. Uh, they got 10000 for the two postseason games and then a $2,000 bonus for the wins. So they did pretty good. That's a pretty good payout for those guys. And I'd be curious to see. Yes, that's on top of their normal salary. Nice. Yep, yep. So that's good for them. It gives them a reason to play harder. I mean, that and having game film. Yep, absolutely. Okay, guys. Let's roll on to some news. All right, next up we got... XFL players signed to the NFL. Now, my count as of today is 21. Uh, We counted using ESPN. But I've got, like, the the official stuff listed on my Facebook for who was signed, from what team, and what awards they got. Check for more of that as it comes. Either one of you two got any names you want to discuss that have been signed? I mean, I know that there's a lot of big names that have gone, so... Yeah, a lot of your big names have gone, and 
similarly, some of your big names have not gone. They've gotten call-ups, but they haven't gotten contracts yet. So some of the big names, you've got uh, John Parker Romo from the Brahmas. He's on contract with uh, the Lions right now. Uh, made 17 of 19 field goals this year. Uh, you look at guys like C.J. Brewer from the Roughnecks. 17 total tackles, two and a half sacks, two tackles for loss. He's alongside another defensive lineman from Houston who went to uh, New Orleans. That's Jack Heflin. Luke Barku, standout corner from San Antonio, the absolute lockdown uh, guy. I mean, he had 31 total tackles and one interception, and that one interception is because somebody screwed up and threw the ball his way. Ben DiNucci is the big name. Jock Patrick, big name. Uh, Danucci from Seattle, the quarterback, and then Patrick, the running back from San Antonio, both signed with the Denver Broncos. There's there was talent. We knew coming into the season there was talent, you know, all over the XFL. Some of these names that got signed didn't really do a whole lot in the league. So you you look at a guy like or in the XFL rather, you look at a guy like Ali's Mack from San Antonio, 230 yards and a touchdown on the season, right? But went and signed with the Tennessee Titans um, almost immediately. Like he, he's one of the, in a series of three days, he was on the third day of, of all these signings. So the talent there may not have translated on the field for whatever reason with, with San Antonio, but the Tennessee Titans like him. He's a big body. The Tennessee Titans like to block with their tight ends, but they also like him to have soft hands. And Elise Mack fits that role. So, you know, these guys are getting they're filling in these kind of niche roles in some cases that we wouldn't have expected and nobody could have predicted based on, you know, how they played during the XFL or even in predictions before the XFL season started. And by the way, Jake, I, I left your boy for you so you could talk to him or talk about him. Yeah, you must be talking about my boy, Hakeem Butler. Yes, sir. That's your boy, yeah. And what's amazing is he's actually joining Barku in Pittsburgh. So it, it, that's going to be interesting how that unfolds uh, going in that season. I, I really, really hope that both do make the cut. Um. The one thing that we don't know for certain is how these contracts are structured. Is it just like a straight line deal where if they just don't make the cut, they're released? Or is it a two-way contract where if they don't make the cut after training camp and preseason, where um, they the team still re- retains the rights they just don't pay their salary. The XFL essentially pays their standard salary for them when they send them back down. That don't know. I tried getting some information from some insiders in the NFL. They couldn't give me much information on that as well. So that's kind of unfortunate. The one thing that I am going to be interested in for sure is regarding Ben DiNucci. He's already going to be coming to the team where he's going to be competing against Jert Stidham uh, from Auburn uh, for that QB2 stop. Jert's got a little bit more experience, at least active duty within the NFL, even though they do have three years each in the league. Um, I, I'm trying to remember. I believe Jarrett played in Las Vegas last season. Keep in mind, they also ger- drafted another Jarrett in the draft out of Washington State. So there's going to be competition for that QB2, uh, QB3 slot. The thing is, is he going to be able to outperform Russell Wilson, who is a, a currently QB1, to even get that starting spot? Looking at the stats from the 22-23 NFL season... Wilson played 15 of those 16 games starting for Denver. And I I'm, don't know who would the backup was last season. So and that's not going to help me find Nick because it's not showing me that information right now. But let's just say that 
that Russell Wilson repeats the same as last season and he starts in uh, 15 of those games. Does Danucci have what it takes to at least start those other two games in case Russell Wilson gets injured or who knows what else? Anything's possible in this league. Uh, somebody could take time off for um, mental health reasons. Completely understandable. Sorry, I don't. I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I'm. I honestly believe that. Danucci is going in there competing for quarterback one position with Russell Wilson. Like Russell Wilson was not impressive at all last year. I think a lot of people on the Broncos didn't like what was going on with him. I I know the fans didn't like what was going on. So the quicker that, you know, the Broncos can get him off of their pay, their pay scale or their payroll rather think they're looking to. And this is, I mean, Danucci played really well as a cowboy when Dak got hurt. Right. So, I mean, he's very much in the QB one discussion there. Sorry, I, I wanted to make nope. sure to throw that in there. Nope, completely understood. I mean, considering, you know, they did fire the people that were in charge of bringing Wilson to Denver to begin with. Because <laughs> I'm trying to think, what's his name? He'd been GM for the longest time, and he was a former player. But he was one of the people that were instrumental in trying to bring him to Denver. And, it, yeah, one year, and it's already proven to be a flop. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm blanking out on his name, but yeah, not GM anymore. The you know, other people that were involved in the deal, not even with the franchise anymore. Obviously, working some of them are working elsewhere in the league now, uh, but yeah, it it's I agree, will agree with you. It was an unmitigated disaster last season. Absolutely. Now, while I agree that. He would be competing for that spot. There is a seven-year contract worth $296 million that makes me think Russell Wilson will start some of these games. That's just me. I think he'll start some of those games, but the question is how short is his leash, especially if Danucci's looking better in practice. We shall see, and I I like it either way. No matter what happens, if Danucci does come back to the XFL, he's going to be primed and ready working with people like Sean Payton. Yep. I mean, a lot of these guys will translate onto an NFL team. We don't know if that means they're going to start, be on the practice squad, be a backup, whatnot, but we hope the best for them. I'm sure we'll see a lot of these guys come again next year, and that's cool too. So either way, I'm happy for them. And it, it's thrilling to me that the XFL is really putting a label on all this and, and showing this off and making it known that this is what the XFL is for. That's probably my biggest takeaway that I'm receiving from all this is how these players sign. They're really getting some praise and they're really getting some, some notoriety, notoriety in what's going on. So. Yep, absolutely. I think that's part of the, that was part of the strategy from the opening uh, for, you know, from the, from the jump for the XFL is they want to be results oriented, results based, factually, you know, sound in the things that they put out and let the product speak for itself. And that's exactly what they've done to this point. So uh, I think that's a huge success in terms of the contracts. Uh, so during the off season, NFL contract or NFL rosters beef up to more than the, what is it? 52 or 53 that they're allowed to have during this active season. You know, they plus up, they get more players. They frowned out their practice squads. And if a player doesn't make it in the NFL and they, ultimately come back to the XFL, the XFL team that had them last retains those rights to those players. So if for some reason Hakeem Butler didn't stick, you guys would get lucky and uh, hold on to him and have a returning 800 yard and eight touchdown receiver to pair with you know, AJ McCarron if he's your quarterback next year. So ultimately, this is a really good deal for the XFL. I think the players that have played in the XFL and went to the NFL are more likely to play again in the XFL than they are to go to a different league. And that's just the way that I see it. All right, fellas, we got two more talking points with the news. Let's talk about the XFL rookie draft. Yes, I said rookie, not Wookie. <laughs> <laughs> the draft takes place on June 16th, and it's going to be held virtually. The following day, they'll have the HBCU showcase. But let's talk about this draft a little more. Just two things I want to know. To get drafted, they had to be eligible to have been drafted in the 2023 NFL draft. And they cannot currently be under a contract by a professional football team. With that, uh, another important piece, T. 
team rosters are now expanded from 51 to 90 players during the offseason. That's huge for keeping guys around when the season actually starts. The next thing I really want to note is that all players who sign an XFL contract, including players who remain under contract from the 2023 season, will have an NFL out until Tuesday, December 26, 2023, following the conclusion of week 16 of the NFL season. All right, I said a lot of words. Drew, break it down for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, as long as you were eligible to have been drafted in the 2023 NFL draft, you have a chance to make an XFL roster. All the names that are going in this pot for the rookie draft have been looked at throughout the year by the talent agency or the scouting agency that the XFL partnered with earlier in the year. Name is uh, slipping my memory right now, but they partnered with these guys specifically for this reason to go out, find talent and bring it all together so that the XFL could have a sustainable product. This is something that's going to happen each off season so that the XFL can remain sustainable and keep that fresh layer of talent really coming in. So the timing as far as the 16th week of the, of the NFL season, basically what that does is gets them up to the playoffs to where they can see who all is going to be there in the playoffs. And if somebody is not going to be in the playoffs, then basically they have the ability to step back and say, okay, well, this person's not good enough. The team can cut them or the team can release them from their contract or whatever the case may be. And those players have a landing spot back in the XFL. Nice, nice. Appreciate the breakdown. All this stuff we're discussing, you can find online yourself through Twitter or Facebook. I mean, in terms of, of what we're looking for, this is progress. One thing at a time with XFL, but I'll tell you what, as soon as the championship game was over, it has been nonstop press releases, news, updates. So I'm impressed so far. Good job, XFL. Absolutely. Anything else to note? I'm sorry, what'd you say, Drew? I was just saying absolutely. And and if if you're gonna ask anything else to note before we move on, yep. uh, I'll ask if I can just transition into the next uh, the next piece of news because it's let's do it. Brilliance. Uh an absolute marketing home run, an absolute opportunity home run, the stroke of geniusness that came with this HBCU showcase day. It's just perfection. But what's the what's the date on that, Matthew? June seventeenth. The day okay. following the draft. So check this out. Deion Sanders, bursting onto the scene as a college football head coach, right? Was a HBCU head coach this past year. Had a lot of success with his son at quarterback and, and some other really good athletes on that team at uh, Jackson State. And around the time that he went to Colorado this offseason and, and around the time of the draft, the big news that came from him, or not even news, but the big comment that came from him was, the lack of HBCU ball players that were drafted in the NFL. And I don't know if this was I don't know if this was planned in advance for the XFL to do a HBCU showcase, but it couldn't if it was planned, it couldn't have broken any more perfectly because now you've got a group of athletes that are highly talented that seem to have been snubbed from the NFL possibly going in or, or doing a showcase for a league that provides a second chance and an opportunity to get back to the NFL or to get to the NFL in the first place. And you're doing it leading up to the Juneteenth holiday. I mean, the, you can't write better, better timing into a story than having something like this. I think it's an absolute stroke of brilliance. I think it's excellent for the players to get this opportunity, especially, you know, close to a holiday that's so, that's so important to them. And, to have the opportunity to get back or to get to the heights that they want to be to finally have an avenue for them to do so. Because if they're not getting drafted in the NFL draft, now they're going to have to work for it and they're going to have to show it. And the XFL hasn't always been around. The USFL hasn't always been around. Now there's a mechanism for it and they get to use that. So I'm super excited to see how many people from HBCUs get to come in and, and really ball out at the XFL level. And furthermore, how many get signed at the NFL level afterwards? You know, I'm actually glad you brought up Coach Prime right there <laughs> because um, just his presence at Colorado makes me want to be a Colorado fan, even though I am a hardcore Mizzou fan. Uh, oh, man, I'm speaking I'm, volumes. I mean, <laughs> seriously, two completely different conferences. Obviously... Anybody that's followed Colorado for any significant amount of time knows 
and I could go the whole American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, Hard Times <laughs> promo, essentially to describe the situation in Colorado. It's the same thing. They're wanting to change. They're tired of losing games and missing opportunities at championships. The fact that Deion Sanders came in from an HBCU to change things, brought his son in to be starting quarterback. I, I mean, I think with the fact that these kids want to improve themselves, I saw the spring game not too long ago. There's a lot of potential in there. So, you know, if they start turning things around and they start winning championships, we could see a lot of people that may slip through the cracks and don't make the NFL by missing out in the draft. They can slip through the cracks and making the X, the XFL, and then they'll make these teams wonder, okay, they see how these guys end up playing in the XFL, and it's like, oh, how come we passed up on them? Dion sent us our best, and we passed on them. What were we thinking? I, I do think Colorado's definitely got something uh, coming through the pipeline for years to come, and... Whether it's the NFL or the XFL, they're going to have players in there by by hook or by crook. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk more about some of the details for this showcase. The showcase is going to be at, at Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, the attendance is by invitation only, but you can sign up and register online. So if you're listening to this and you're eligible, you can sign up now. With that, there is some eligibility stuff, costs associated. Player registration costs is $260, but if you make it on an active XFL roster, they reimburse you that money. So if you're confident in your skills, go at it. Now, parts about the eligibility, I'm not real sure about in full, but, I mean, it's listed here. You don't have to be at a certain school. You don't have to be graduated from a certain program I mean, as long as you have exhausted your college football eligibility and graduated before 2019, and there's not more than four years elapsed since your last game or professional game, then you can go to this showcase and show out. And just to to polish that up a little bit, uh, Matt, it's uh, or graduated from, from college, either exhausted all of your eligibility or graduated from college i think you said and i just want to make sure there's no like confusion there well in terms of the eligibility i mean all, only graduated from it says high school it doesn't say you have to graduate from college right so that's i just wanted to note that um but yeah you're right if you're interested get on and check it out i mean it's we're not we're, we're just a bunch of fatties sitting on doing <laughs> podcasts but this is for athletes and this is where you're going to get seen by a lot of eyes. So, and for the price of a high school uh, recruiting camp or less, that's not bad. No, and that's it runs right with the other combines that they run with the XFL. I forget the name of the company, but the cost is is very similar. Um, I've had a few guys that I've actually sent that info to for them to inquire more about it all right guys that about wraps it up for the news do we have anything else on the showcase or anything we want to discuss before we start closing out for the evening don't believe so i think we pretty much touched on on everything seems like we hit it yes sir now i want to talk a little bit about my time at the xfl championship as media and Drew and I both, we've attended many a games for the XFL this season in Houston. Uh, Drew's actually attended D.C. once, but I have not got to visit another stadium. So it was an experience. San Antonio is beautiful. The stadium was beautiful. The dome was beautiful. The press box was awesome. You're really close to the action. It's loud. You can see everyone. I mean, you're not in an enclosed space. You're, You're out in the action. Some of the best things about this in my in my opinion, was meeting some of these other XFL analysts and media guys. Mike Mitchell wasn't there. I really wanted to meet him. But um, I actually got to sit by Anthony Miller during the game. So it was an awesome time just talking to him, listening to some of his good, good football knowledge that he 
he's got a lot too. Uh, Reed Johnson with the Marcast talked a lot with him. We did a lot did a lot of networking and it, it was a good time. The feel of that game was very Super Bowlish. Uh, everything was serious and on a on a big big scale, especially coming from Houston. And even it, 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 I was a little taken back by some of the things how it was different. It was an enjoyable time, great experience, and I suggest if anyone can make it, even as a fan, to the next XFL championship. In 2024, please do go, because it was an awesome time. I had a great time. Uh, Check out our Facebook. Check out our social media. I post stuff all the time. I kind of took a break after everything, but I've still got a lot of pictures and stuff that I need to post from that event. Uh, Thank you, XFL, for letting me come. I appreciate that greatly. So if you listen, XFL, appreciate you. And don't worry, we're here to work for you. So thanks again. I want to say thanks to Ambush, too, for getting me in and getting me on. That list was pretty, pretty uh, small for approvals. So to get there was a big deal. So thanks, Ambush, for getting me into the media seat this whole season. Thank you so much. Like I said, I said thanks to Ambush already. I want to say thanks to XFLboard.com. XFL Board has posted our podcast on their site throughout the season. They will continue to, as far as I know. Great site. Great people that run it. Look forward to meeting some of them in person sometime as well. But anyway, I just wanted to note, really, that game and the experience. I loved it. It was a great time. Got some unforgettable experiences. And probably one of the biggest impacts and significant football memories of my whole life so thank you nice guys before we close out hit the people with your socials where to find you any information that they need to know drew wells at ambush sports h-o-u for houston at ambush sports h-o-u that is twitter before i give my info i do want to give a little bit of a shout out to the battle hawks trey watson uh who currently has Charity auctions going for four of his custom cleats that he wore during the uh, 2023 season. Uh, so the the um, proceeds from those auctions is going to support the Boys and Girls Clubs of the Greater St. Louis region, uh, specifically uh, regarding providing access to youth po- um, uh, youth football. Um, more information on that is available at Go dot charity auctions today dot com uh, i know uh, watson had made a shout out in the uh, official st louis battle hawks group uh props up for him to doing that because youth football is a crucial role in getting these kids um interested in the sport keeping them out of trouble and then hopefully setting their sights high to one day become pros. Um, as far as my socials, find me on uh, Facebook, um, Jake Leonard. Um, I'm the uh, MOS um, editor and ma- mostly everything St. Louis related at Ambush Sports. Um, I manage a Facebook page for the MOS part. Never got the chance to set it up for XFL, but I'll get that ready for next season. Um, on Twitter, you can find me at Jake Leonard JRN. As always, I am your host, Matthew Tyler. It has been a pleasure this season, and I look forward to many, many more. We look to record, I'd say, it, we're going to kind of let things build up before we record. We don't want to have some pointless recordings every week. So check for us every couple weeks, maybe weekly, depending on the updates and news that are occurring within the XFL. Go ahead, Jake. What you got? Is there an announcement you would like to give to or present to our audience, or is this something that might want to wait for the next podcast? Great timing, and you are correct, Jake. We look to expand to video for our next podcast. Now, with that, we'll still have a podcast to stream on networks, but we really are going to try to hit on some live streams from social sites and our own website in the future. So 
check for a video podcast from us next recording session. You will definitely have the links available through the XFL Insider Podcast social pages and as well as Jake and Drew's pages also. Like I said, these will be live streams, so people will be able to ask questions, possibly call in depending. Uh, We'll see what happens. But we want to kind of join a more interactive XFL and I feel like this is really going to get us there. Most of our stuff, I mean, is if you if you could see us talking, you could see how passionate we are about these subjects. So hopefully that will translate into the video. And uh, I look forward to, to getting some new stuff started and, and really having some different stuff to show people at home besides a backdrop. So I just thought I would go ahead and let them know if they want to get an early start on following us. We do have an official channel on uh, twitch.tv. It's at uh, twitch.tv forward slash ambush sports network. That will probably be one of the venues we'll be broadcasting. I'm sure there's other things we'll probably be trying to figure out on other aspects of social media. So just keep an eye out on uh, the announcements on Facebook and Twitter on the uh, official podcast uh, social media pages. Definitely be posting as much as possible when we come up with a scheduled date for our next recording. So check it out. It'll be on all the fan groups, ambush sites. I mean, we should, we should have a pretty good, uh, span to really pass out this information. Check it out. Look forward to it and uh, look forward to giving you guys some more great content through the Facebook and Twitter applications. Guys, anything else before we close it out? Love you guys. I love you too. I love the XFL. (laughs) I love our fans. I just, every, it's all about love, brother. Let's giddy up and uh, right on <laughs> until the sunset, until the next episode. <laughs> That's it for us, guys. Time to hit those death trails. Goodbye. <laughs>